Everyone else can open up to Revelation chapter 5, please. Revelation chapter 5. I'm looking forward to being in the text today. It's, it's actually, uh, I guess, a little bit uh, of a different message than what oftentimes we think of as a Sunday morning message uh, in, in normal circumstances. Uh, Revelation does preach a little bit differently. Uh, the application, of course, is that it's the Word of God. It's profitable for all the things that the Scripture is profitable for. Uh, but sometimes it would be more akin to what something I would preach on a Sunday night or a uh, Wednesday night. And that's the way I feel about the message this evening. By the way, if you like the message, you should come Sunday night. Yeah. And you should come Wednesday night. We yeah. have a lot of preaching in our church. Uh, so, sometimes I'll just explain why we do things the way we do in our church and try to every now and again just to let you know why we're thinking the way we are. And uh, one of the things that we do uh, on purpose is that we don't call our Wednesday night service a uh, prayer service or Wednesday night Bible study. Now, if we're in the Bible, and we study the Scripture, but we also preach the Scripture. There's a different amount of authority that comes uh, from Bible study and Bible preaching. Bible study is when we are endeavoring to you know, uh, study a book or to know something about the Word of God. And boy, that's profitable, and that's good for us as believers. But preaching is literally where... God's authority is behind it. God uses the foolishness of preaching. It's something that uh, if you try to understand it from an intellectual aspect, you'll miss it. But it's something that God uses and He wants to be part of the fellowship of the believers, the preaching services. We had to get together for Bible study and for that. But I found that the Bible study has diminished the church. In other words, a lot of people say, well, it's, you know, it's just Bible study and I can do that at home, I can do whatever. And it's not the same as coming together in a fellowship in a preaching service. So in our church, we've deliberately kept the preaching service. We have prayer time afterward. And we're, of course, studying the Bible. Our Sunday school would be more akin to Bible study. That would be a time when we would look at topics and we would learn things. And you say, Pastor, how come we don't have a lot of Bible studies in our church? Well, actually, we do. Uh, Sunday morning, 10 a.m., we have a lot of different Bible studies, and we'd like to have more, actually. We're uh, praying and, and uh, praying the Lord will open doors for us to have more teachers and for us to... Uh, have more topics, more groups that can come together around the Word of God and study it and so forth. But that would be the distinction of that. So I hope that's a help to you, maybe to understand what we're thinking. You know, sometimes you, you can understand what someone's thinking. You don't necessarily have to agree with it. I've had people, well, Pastor, I know you believe that. I don't necessarily agree with you. Well, that's all right. Uh, but at least you know where we're coming from, right? So I hope that's a help to you. I uh, want to see the church grow, not people go away from being part of the church fellowship and when I was growing up Sunday morning Sunday night Wednesday night all the believers were there and today it isn't so much so now it seems like once a week is oftentimes as much as a person will go to church and I don't think that I don't think that our families are better for it I don't think that our churches are better for it I don't think our country is better for it do you do you see us improving or declining well if we're going to go the other direction we need to go back uh, to some things that have changed that shouldn't have and that's the way I feel about uh, the preaching, the Word of God. And we need more faithful Christians. I'm encouraged, by the way, by the next generation. Teenagers. Man, I'll tell you, I've got, uh, I told our teenagers this morning, I'm biased, I know that, but I believe that I've just got the best young people anywhere in the county. And uh, honestly, we just have some wonderful teenagers, and I think God's going to do some incredible things as they are the now generation. They literally are the ones that right now are going to begin serving the Lord, and they're, they're going to, the, the, the church and reaching the lost is going to be entrusted to them in the very, very near future. They're going to be our leaders. And so we're really looking forward to, I, I think we have a bright future. Just based on the young folks that we have, I see, a, I see a bright future. And so young people don't stop serving God. You, uh, you be faithful. You grow. Everything that, everything that God lays on your heart to do, you do more. You get closer to Him. Are you in Revelation chapter 5? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. If it's on the same page, would you look back to verse... Uh, verse 10, and I, I want to read just down to verse 5, uh, from chapter 4, verse 10, to chapter 5, verse 5. You see it? Mm -hmm. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things... And for thy pleasure they are and were created. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. 
And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. We're going to need God's help. Let's, let's ask Him for it. Father, I pray that You'd help us, Lord, first of all, to uh, make it through the material today in a timely manner, uh, but God, with comprehension. Lord, help us not to forget that there's a blessing for individuals that, that uh, hear and read and do the, the things that are in this book of prophecy. And I pray that You would help us to be able to have that blessing as a result of our time today. And then, God, I pray for understanding. God, it may be that this is the time of the morning that some of us are sleepy or some of us are distracted. And I pray that you would just help us to be focused and alert. And then, God, I pray for our hearts, that we would have hearts that are willing to receive truth and that would be just asking the question, Lord, what would you want me to do? What would you have me to do? And I pray that you would help us to have that kind of a heart's attitude. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well. Uh, several weeks ago when we were finishing up our series on worship, we actually preached, before we began our Revelation series, we preached chapter 4 of Revelation because it really is all about worship. Uh, worship, we saw in our series, is really about seeing God where and who He is and seeing ourselves in light of who God is. And when you do that, when you come to a place of worship, you realize that God is high and lifted up, that He's holy and His presence is separates Him from us because we're the opposite of that. When a person worships God who's high and lifted up, the thing they naturally do is to fall down and get as low as they can. Matter of fact, I feel like when I worship God that I really ought to go to the lowest place on earth. What's that, the Dead Sea? I think is the, the lowest place on earth. And, uh, you know, let's have a worship service over there sometime. You want to? That'd be a lot of fun, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> But to go to the lowest place on earth, and that, I mean, the very lowest that I could be is the rightful place when I'm worshiping a God who's high and lifted up. You think about high places on earth, and you think of mountaintops, uh, but God, God's higher than that. Uh, you think of high places, and you think of the space, and the space is so vast, and yet God is beyond that. And the reality of it is that God is high, and He's lifted up, and what separates God from us is His holiness. That is, he's absent from sin or evil or any of the things that really actually define me. I was conceived in sin. That's, that's what I am. I am defined as a sinner. God's the opposite of that. The natural thing for me to do is to fall down before him. When we were in our worship series, we began in Isaiah chapter 6 with Isaiah's description of the temple uh, or of the, the, the place, the throne room where God is, the holy place where God is in heaven, or in the heavens. And Isaiah described God the same way John did. Just the, the atmosphere, if you want to just look at two parallels and say, what is it like where God is? Well, the two people that described it, Isaiah and John, described it as a place of holiness. And we saw the conclusion of that description by there being four and twenty elders that are around the throne and... They're worshiping Him. Well, what do we do when we worship? We fall down. We bow before Him. So they're worshiping Him. And the Bible says uh, that they, they fall down before Him. They worship Him. And here's what they say. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You have trouble understanding who God is and what God's purpose or plan for your life is. You, the foundational truth that you need to understand in knowing who you are and who God is is that you're created for God's pleasure. You're created for God's pleasure. And in order for you to find satisfaction, in order for you to find success in life, God has to have pleasure from you. Are you... Are you performing as expected. Are you what God made you to be? You say, well, pastor, I want to be for my pleasure. You'll never be happy that way. 
because it's not what you're made for. The only way you can be satisfied, find satisfaction, is to be what you're created for. And you're created for God's pleasure. I'm telling you, this is such a key. It's so simple. And yet, because of our wrong thinking, it's oftentimes one of the truths that undermines people's happiness. You want to be happy, you be what you were made for, and you're made for God's pleasure. You look at what the Scripture says that you can know for certain about that, and you be what God wants you to be. And my friend, you'll find satisfaction. In the same way that I think all of us could relate to. When we actually have a time, isn't it special in our services when we have a call to worship? When all of us just bow before God? How do you feel, when, how do you feel after you've bowed before God and come into His presence? What's it feel like afterward? You're exalting God, you're lowering yourself, but it feels great, doesn't it? Because that's what we're made for. We're made to worship God, we're made for His pleasure. And believer, I'll tell you, without worship in your life, you will not have satisfaction. You will not know God's purpose and God's plan. And uh, you'll be frustrated at every juncture, at every turn, uh, because you're trying something for your pleasure instead of for God's pleasure. Now, uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, John is going to begin a next phase. Okay, and I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Now before we look at those seven seals, I want to emphasize one word, and that word is actually in chapter 4 and verse 1. Somebody who sees it already, tell me what that word is. The first word, John 4, 1. What? After. After. Okay, let me ask you a question. Past, present, future. The word after. Which comes latest? The future, right? And it comes after the past, right? And it comes after the present, right? Okay, so if we know the outline of the book of Revelation from Revelation 119, right? The things which are, and the things are the, the things which were, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Can you help me to understand what part of the outline we are beginning? After. After. That's the future events in Revelation. Revelation is written by a God who's a grammarian. I do not mean to be condescending or insulting, but sometimes we think we're so smart because of technology that we don't think God's very smart or we don't think that people that have gone before us are very smart. I'll tell you something that will be humbling for you would be to learn languages and learn to read some ancient languages. Uh, learn uh, just... The, the language that the New Testament was written in and that Revelation's written in, the Greek language sometime, and you'll understand that it is an extremely accurate language. Every verb has a tense built into the verb. Every subject or every noun has its part of speech in it. You can take in the Greek language and you can mix the words all up and know exactly where they belong because they don't have to be in order because they are so accurate in their descriptions. Uh, there's not just present, past, and future tense. There are a lot of tenses besides that. And there are uh, there's punctiliar. There's it happened at a pinpoint time. Then there's uh, then there's uh, a tense where it happened here and it had continuing results. There is it is continuous and it has no beginning. There's it has a beginning and it, there's and the, the language is so incredibly accurate uh, that our languages can't rival it. Actually. Uh, as our language is devolving as we move away from using the King James Bible in America, uh, as we're losing our language, we're becoming less accurate. Uh, but this, uh, the book that the, the Word of God is written in is incredibly accurate. Let me just say this, grammar came from God. God's a grammarian. Now, I know it's an understatement. I know it may seem boring to you to say that, but you and I need to understand that a lot of people get off theologically because they just think the Bible's a loosely written book that's open for interpretation. No, the Bible is not a loosely written book intended to be interpreted. It is an accurately written book intended to be understood. Amen. There's a big difference. It's not, well, this is what you think or this is how I interpret it. It is, this is what God said and this is what He meant. And when an outline is given like is given in Revelation chapter 1. This is what you're going to write. Here's the order you're going to write. The things which were. So he wrote the circumstances that came about. 
the things which are, that's the present tense where we saw the church. You'll not see the church again in Revelation. You'll never see the church mentioned again because the church is gone in the after portion. And so now we're in the after portion. This is what is going to happen when the church is no longer on this earth. Now, you say, Pastor, why are you emphasizing that so much? Because it, it is a trend, a theological trend today, for people to deny that the next event on God's calendar will be for Him to be in the sky and to call up His church. That's the next event on God's calendar. Amen. And if you just know grammar, and if you have a little bit of common sense to follow the outline of the Revelation, you'll see that the events that are coming up, which have to do with God's wrath toward the wicked, they are not for believers. First of all, you'll find great comfort in it. Tribulation may come from the wicked toward us, but tribulation will not come from God toward us. You'll never face God's wrath for the wicked because Jesus did that on your behalf. And my friend, the theological implications of a person not believing that are first of all arrogant, they're wicked, and they are so inaccurate. God's wrath will never be toward the individuals that He has already judged His Son for. And so it's important for us to just simply look at the grammar here and say, okay, the word after means after what? After the church. That's what it means, chapter 4. We'll see some support for that as well. Uh, with uh, let, Let's go to, um, while you're turning to Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 12, I would just like to look at where uh, what we're alluding to in our text here today. I don't know for you if uh, Daniel was as much of a, of a study as it's been for me. But I'll tell you, there's some deep things in Daniel. And when you are reading chronologically through the Bible, not chronologically, when you're reading through the Bible in order as it's written, as though it's chronological, I'll tell you what, you're a lot better served to read Revelation first and then read Daniel afterward. But if you're reading through your Bible, Genesis through Revelation, you come to Daniel and you're going to say, I don't know what a lot of this is. But if you read Revelation and you read Daniel, you'll say, okay, I know what that is. And this is one of those texts, one of those contexts. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, uh, this is Daniel, and this is, this is kind of his uh, conclusion to the prophecy that God had uh, given him of future events, and it's at the end of his life. And I want to read verses 1 through 4. And at that time shall, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even at that same time. Has that happened yet? No. No, it has not. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And I'm not going to do anything more than make a general statement here, uh, but there are individuals who are wrong about end time events, and they do not understand that it's talking about the Jews. National Israel. National Israel. And you can... You can go off into all the anti-Semitic uh, uh, jargon that you like to, but the Jews are Israel. That's what we're talking about. The word Bible uses the word Jew. They're Jewish people. They're not some people uh, that are something other than people. A lot of people say, oh, the Jews aren't Jews. Israel's not Israel. That's just anti-Semitism. It's nonsense. And if you just go to the Word of God, you can get some of that cleared up instead of uh, going on the Internet. Okay, but well, there's a lot of bad internet theology that's happening right now. A lot of it's anti-Semitic. And uh, by the way, uh, Israel today is not Israel in the sense that they're believers. They're called Jews. They say they're Jews and they're not. The Bible says it's not because of a national problem, it's because of a Messiah problem. They're not acknowledging their Messiah. But in the future events in Revelation, we're going to see that Israel turns to their Messiah. And they'll be Jews indeed when they do that. But the national Israel, national Israel, are the apple of God's eye. Some of the most wicked people on earth are Jewish. Some of the most anti-God, some of the most uh, blasphemous, wicked people on earth are, are uh, Jewish. And God still loves them. You better be careful. You better be careful with your anti-Semitism. You better watch out. I'm warning this church. None of that. None of that here. God loves them and His plan is to redeem them and to save them. And He's not finished with them yet. You better look out. You better watch out what you say. As though some, for some reason, as Paul would tell the church at Rome, as 
though the wild branches, contrary by nature, which have been grafted in, should boast themselves against the nat natural branches. Mm -hmm. When the natural branches turn to the branch, the root, in belief, my friend, they'll fit much more naturally than we who are Gentiles and are contrary by nature. And you better watch what you say. First of all, you don't know who's believed. Any person in the world, you can look at and say they're as wicked as they could be, and they'll be just like any person was before they came to Jesus. And I'm reminded oftentimes that the reason that a person is living and have, has breath is because God is giving them space for repentance. Anyone can repent. Anyone can change, and I'm the proof of that, and so are you. You better be careful. You better be careful looking down your nose at somebody that Christ died for, even if they're not born again yet. Now, they may be blaspheming, but if God is merciful to them, you better not be unmerciful. Who are you? Who am I? And we ought to ask that question frequently, and we ought to answer it in light of the Scripture. Well, Daniel is being spoken to by Michael about a time of trouble, and the time of trouble is not for the church. The time of trouble is for national Israel. He's answering the question that Daniel was asking when he realized that 70 years had been fulfilled, which Jeremiah had prophesied until the captivity in Babylon would be over. And there was a decree that was issued, but God helped Daniel understand that the 70 years were 70 weeks. A week is a period or measure of seven, and that there, uh, if you study Daniel chapter 9, you'll see that minus one week, that that was a prophecy of the Messiah coming and then being cut off, not for himself, but for the sins of the people. Now, I'm not preaching that message today from Daniel, but the men from Babylon who were not Jewish, who came to Jerusalem and asked, where is he that is born of the king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east or come to worship him. They understood that a week is just like we use the term dozen to mean twelve, or we use the, the term a couple to mean two. A week meant a measure of seven. And seven, 70 times seven was 490 minus seven years, which is 393 years. There's a week left. And that week is the one we're going to see here in Revelation, that last week, which is the after week. That's what's coming up here. And so now Daniel is told, right now is not the time that God's going to restore the kingdom to Israel. God had a plan in between that the Messiah is going to come, He's going to be cut off, and now we have this period of time, which is the church that God has introduced, which is an interlude. It's, a, it's the age of grace. It's the age of the presidents calling. Don't worry about it. It's the age of grace. It's the age of mercy. It is, uh, it is God's being, uh, being uh, literally offering to the world that all the nations can come in. But that last week, my friend, is a week where God is working in the world through Israel. One last qualifying statement that I'm going to make today, and that's that even when God was working through Israel, no one was excluded. Even when God was working through Israel, no one was excluded. Anyone could come to God His way through Israel. We have in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ individuals who are not Israel. We have Tamar. Uh, we have Rahab. Uh, we have Ruth. We have individuals who are part of the line because they chose, uh, because they made a choice to respond to God His way. When you come to God, you'll come to Him His way in any age. It'll always be through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. And those individuals desired that. Well, here we are. Uh, let's, let's get to chapter uh, 12 and, and down to verse... Let's read 2, 3, and 4. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. I think we understand that, don't we? And they that, should, that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forevermore. By the way, sometimes you have a Jehovah's Witness comes by and tells you you just go into the ground and you cease to exist. Take them to Daniel chapter 12 and read it for them, would you? And you can see that there's a resurrection. There's life after death. You talk to Sadducees who say, well, there's a God, but you know he's not an eternal God or we don't have eternal life. Take them to Daniel chapter 12. If they claim to believe the Bible sometime, that'll be a problem for them because it's indicating that every person, the dead, are going to be raised up and every person is going to be judged according to the book. All right, now verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Now let me ask you a question. What comes last? <laughs> the end, right? I'm just trying to help you. 
uh, words mean they have meaning. The meaning is simple, and if if intelligent people don't understand them, my friend, it's because they're too smart for their own good. Intelligent people can be pretty dumb sometimes. I'm, not, I'm talking about intellect. I know people that have high IQs and they do stupid things. And they believe stupid things. And uh, I know the word stupid is not a nice word, but my wife is not in the room and the juniors didn't hear me and the teens wouldn't say stupid because they know it's pastor privilege that allows you to use that word. And so you have to be a pastor before you can use the word stupid. And so I just it's just one more enticement for people to desire the office of a bishop. All right, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge uh, shall be increased. Okay, you see that seal the book? Go to chapter 5 of Revelation, will you please? Revelation chapter 5. Uh, in verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. What's the word in Daniel? End. What's the word in Revelation? After. Where are we now at in events, chronologically, in Revelation? After. After, After what? After the, After the church. After the church. This is the time when God has told Daniel specifically, Israel... And her restoration, Israel and her Israel and her kingdom are not for now. It's going to be in the end. Wait for the end. Here it is. Seal it up. Seal the book. What do we have here? We have John in the part of Revelation, which is to write the things which shall be hereafter. What's the first thing we see? We see that book that was sealed. We see the book that was sealed. And so here we begin the future events of Revelation. Here we begin to see things that will happen after the church. And here we see things that specifically are God working through national Israel again. Replacement theologians, uh, they do not interpret uh, the Revelation literally here. Uh, they, they play all kinds of games and all sorts of shenanigans to try to put the church in the time of tribulation where the wicked are being judged and to put uh, and to replace God's future plan for Israel with the church. And my friend, it's, it's a theological fallacy and uh, it's just wrong. If you read 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 and you interpret them uh, just as they're written, you'll understand that we're going to be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds. We're going to be part of those individuals that Daniel describes in chapter 12 as coming back and being part of the hereafter. But we're coming uh, with the Lord Jesus. We're going to be part of those armies. And so we're going to begin now, this week, we're beginning the future events, the future prophecy of Revelation. Now we're going to look at one last thing here this morning, uh, and then we'll be finished for today. In verse 2, John said, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book, and to loose the seals thereof. And the Bible says, And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth were, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Do you remember verse 11 of chapter 4? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. No man is worthy. Only God is worthy. And again, we see, as we begin to look at the hereafter events, we see the first thing that we find is the worthiness of our Savior. Worthiness of our God. In verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, this is John, he said, I wept much. One of the elders, verse 5, saith unto me, Weep not. Behold. The word behold means to look up. Look. Behold. Lo. Look. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. In case there's any doubt in our minds whom the lion of the tribe of Judah is, let's look at the origin of the, of the Lion of Judah. That will be the last thing we'll see this morning. Again, I've said to you that the message today is more akin to a Sunday night or a Wednesday night uh, sermon that would be preached. But uh, this, is, this is the order of events here. Uh, and here we are. Uh, go to Genesis chapter 29. Will you please? Genesis chapter 29. I want to just read this this account of Leah, who was a despised wife of Jacob, who later became Israel. 
we are when we talk about Judah, are we talking about the church? No, we talk about the tribe of Judah. Are we talking about the church? No. Are we talking about? We're not, are we? What are we talking about? Yeah. We're talking about Israel. It's it's incredible. You say, you, you may not know what's going on with all the the, the uh, messed up theology today. It's a real issue with a replacement theology. And I'm just telling you, it just does not jive with the Scripture. It just doesn't work with knowing what the Scripture says. Who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? And who's the tribe of Judah? Well, Judah is Israel, or Jacob's first son. Verse 31, chapter 29, When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, and opened, or he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son. She called his name Reuben. For she said, Sure the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. She called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I bore him three sons. Therefore was his name Levi. Pay attention to verse 35. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Every other time she had a son, she mentioned her husband who despised her, and she thought that her sons would cause her husband to love her. This time when she had a son, she didn't mention Jacob anymore. She said, now I'll praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left off bearing. It's interesting that Judah, the tribe of Judah, is, is uh, our descendants of the son that Leah had that were not focused on a man, they were focused on God. Now you say, but Judah was not a godly man. No, but God had a plan through the tribe of Judah. Go, if you will, now to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. I'll we'll look at Jacob before he died. His blessing on Judah. Chapter 49 and, and uh, go to verse 8. Each of his sons he mentioned a blessing to. Reuben was his firstborn. Simeon and uh, Levi were brethren in cruelty. But verse 8, Judah... Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Now what did the children of Jacob think when Joseph said that one of his children bowed down before him, or that their sheaves bowed before him, and their stars bowed before him? They had a problem with that, didn't they? But now, what do we see here? Jacob had a problem with that. Jacob's blessing was, Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Why would the children of Jacob bow to Judah? Because this is a messianic prophecy of Jesus Christ. It's a messianic price, a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't bow to anyone but God. Yeah. Judah is a lion's well. Oh, lion of the tribe of Judah. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? And so there is mentioned the strength of the young lion, the, the tenacity or the courage of the old lion. Verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet, until Shiloh come. Who's that? It's Jesus. That's Jesus. This is a prophecy. Of Jesus Christ, binding his fall into the vine, his ass is called in the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, his teeth white with milk. We go back to Revelation chapter 5. Who's worthy? Who's worthy to open the book? What tribe was David from? Judah. Judah. What was the prophecy uh, to David? What was his special? Uh, what was the special promise that God made to David? What? Okay. Yeah. Well, that was the Lord said unto my Lord. That's about Jesus. That's David prophesying about Jesus. What did God promise David? Stay on the throne. Yeah, his seed would sit on the throne forever. He's not going to cease one to sit on the throne. He is the fulfillment of that prophecy, and the throne forever is the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Now, are we talking about the church here? No. Are we talking about the church here? No. My friend, the hereafter is not the church, it's Israel. You're anti-Israel, you're anti-Semitic, get used to it, my friend. The kingdom's going to be a Jewish kingdom. 
when Jesus comes and He rules on earth for a thousand years, it will be a Jewish kingdom. It will be a Jewish reign. And we'll be part of it. We'll be grafted in. We'll be the Gentiles that according to Ezekiel are able to sojourn. And by the way, the benefit of that is we get to pick our territory. I need to get over to Israel sometime and plant my sequoia pine cone so that I can get me a, a long-lasting uh, tree over there. And I can say uh, during the millennial reign, I planted that tree. This is my property here. And so I need to go over and make some plans. But listen, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be part of it. I'm going to be part of this tribe. I'm adopted into it. Theologically, there's a lot of significance of chapter 5 and of chapter 4 and the word after, aren't there? There's a lot of grammatical theological significance. And that Jesus Christ is going to be that king. Sits on the throne. You say, what about David sitting on the throne? God's got a special place for David. Okay. There's some special things that we'll see about David as we go through Revelation. But Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah, not David. And David wouldn't have said, the root of David. The root of David. Who's the descendant of David? What was the prophecy to David? Jesus. And he had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So we're told to Daniel, or we're told in Daniel, Daniel, don't worry about it right now. I'm going to set up a kingdom later. I'm going to work with your people. Who are Daniel's people? Jews. He was a prince from Judah. So who are Daniel's people? Well, it was the Jews. And so what is the reference in chapter 5 about? All the events that are future events, the things that we're going to see are going to happen in our future. Who are they to? Jews, to Israel. And so this is the portion of Revelation that applies to what God's going to do in the future. Now I want to conclude uh, with where we began. We began in our study with the promise that there's a blessing for those that read and understand the words of the book. Now you may ask the question, if I'm going to do the things that are written in the book of prophecy, what can I do about something that's in the future? Well, you can live now in light of it. And so what we're going to see in the next several weeks as we study through Revelation are truths that will give us answers about the future. Knowing the future does us no good if we do not live the present in light of it. But it's important for us to understand where we're living. Today we're living in the present and we're living in light of things that God's going to do in the future. Father, thank you so much for the revelation. Thank you for what you've taught us here in the Scripture today. God, help us not to, to gloss over or pass over it. Help us to uh, get our theology uh, straight and to God to, to be biblical in our, in our thinking, our response. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your good attention this morning. You're dismissed.